stay and get education and so many things. Um, or you can just give donation. Uh, give some donation out of the proceeds or out of the results of the work. Now this is ordinary karma yoga, but then there's better, even better class of karma yoga, which is that you learn the science of devotional service personally. You engage your family members in the activities of devotional service, and then you teach or preach devotional service in your local area. Yeah. And we've been trying to get this program going uh, ever since we started, but most people aren't ready for that. So what we do is now we have the uh, University of Higher Knowledge, and you can take courses in devotional service according to the Vedic scriptures at home, over the internet, at your own speed, on your own schedule. And in that way, you can gradually advance into practices until you understand this philosophy well enough that you can implement it independently. Uh, we want to make our students strong. We don't want to make them dependent on us, but we want them to be able to practice independently. Uh, but actually, if you, if you give the results from your career or from your work to spiritual causes, I don't mean just ordinary charity. That might be in the mode of passion or the mode of goodness. But I'm talking about devotional service, where you give money for devotional activities. Uh, this is very powerful karma yoga. And although on the surface it may sound like we're a regular church or temple, oh, give some money for our temple. It's not exactly like that. We're, we're not an ordinary devotional or religious organization. We are an esoteric school. And the difference is that we are uh, based on having a personal relationship with a self-realized soul. You see? Guru means self-realized soul. That's the real definition of guru. Just like Arjuna asks Krishna in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, he says, how does a man in knowledge look? How does he speak? How does he walk? And how does he sit? Uh, and you notice he's asking all these questions from the external point of view. What are the external symptoms of a self-realized soul? But when Krishna replies to him, Krishna says, a man who is in transcendental knowledge has no attraction or desire for material sense gratification. See? He doesn't become happy when good things happen. He doesn't become sad when bad things happen. So Krishna is talking on the psychological platform or the spiritual platform, the in platform of inner life. See? You have to find somebody like that who understands consciousness and the inner life and who can explain everything on the platform of consciousness who has actually realized this teaching of Bhagavad Gita and so forth. That's real guru. And if you study with someone like that, that's no longer religion. Religion means you have to believe in something. And you hope in the future you will understand the truth of it. But that's not what we're doing. We're saying, if you understand this esoteric teaching, you will immediately realize the truth of it. You'll immediately get the benefit of it because this teaching is on the platform of consciousness. And consciousness is the primary symptom of the spirit soul, the jiva. Uh, wherever there's jiva, there's consciousness. So that's the platform of this esoteric teaching. And if you help us in our mission, then Krishna will make it possible for you eventually to get beyond this material identification. Isn't that right, Neville? Neville, who's with us today, uh, for, what was it, over a year, he was giving like $100 a month or more. <laughs> and now just see, he's living with us here in Chile at our ashram, and he's helping develop the courses for the university and so many things. So uh, by gradual application of the principles of karma yoga, one develops detachment from material things 
and becomes able to perform devotional service at the highest level. It's not ordinary thing. Karma yoga is not ordinary when it's dovetailed with devotional service. So that's how. Any more questions? No? What time is it? Hmm. Okay. I have a short darshan. I mean, uh, satsa. Any more or less questions? is written down uh, in, in the scriptures like that is so that devotees can be encouraged in their spiritual life that they see okay that I, I had this symptom or that symptom and this is mentioned here so now I know that I'm making advancement or why is the, like, what's the point of mentioning them okay the question is why are all these symptoms of devotional ecstasy written down in the scriptures because when we think about something, we need a proper terminology to describe it. Well, if you say, well, I had a feeling, and then I had this other feeling, and then I felt something, and then I did something. <laughs> That's not very helpful. Huh? But if you say, well, I had this anubhava of laughing, and then I thought about Krishna's uh, pastimes with the gopis, and then I almost fainted, and, and I wanted to roll in the in the, the footprints of Krishna, you know. And and if you can say all these things with the proper terminology, then it becomes meaningful to other people, and you can actually share them and talk about them with other people. See, if we don't have the the terminology and the understanding of what it means, there's two problems. So the one problem is. We can't share it with other people. But the other problem, which is even worse, is we can't describe it to ourselves. For example, everybody is conscious to some degree or other. <laughs> but because we have no terminology in our Western language to describe consciousness, everyone misunderstands consciousness. And they don't realize that they are having a spiritual experience every moment. The significance of consciousness is extremely profound because it is the primary symptom of the spirit soul. Yet most people trivialize consciousness. They take it for granted. Why? Because there's no language to describe the different functions and states of consciousness in our Western language. That's why I gave that whole explanation in Transontology on what consciousness is. And I think the beautiful explanation is that when the conquistadores came to South America, that the natives couldn't see their boats. They could not see the boats because they had no word, no concept, no ability to conceptualize an ocean-going vessel. Huh? And when the conquistadores came and attacked Mexico City, the Aztec capital, huh, with, what was it, 5,000 mounted cavalry horses, uh, cavalry soldiers, there, they had an army of 200,000 men just panic and flee. And the conquistadores won the battle by default because there was no resistance. Why? These guys had never seen a mounted cavalry soldier before. They had no word for it. They had no concept for it. They couldn't understand what they were seeing. And of course, they had no idea what it was capable of. So they just freaked out. And these are like battle-hardened warriors. Huh? But when they saw these mounted soldiers, they cracked. They couldn't deal with it. See, So this is why you hear occasionally uh, horror stories about people getting 
some kind of spiritual experience that drives them crazy. Uh, because they have no terminology, they have no structure, no understanding of cause and effect, no idea of the scope of these symptoms, uh, no concept of, of how they involve, evolve or what they mean. You see? So that's why God, Krishna, kind of protects himself or protects us from him. Because in this material concept of life, if we were to experience this ecstasy, well, we would go mad. We would we'd lose it. Huh? We wouldn't understand where it was coming from. There's a, there's a great story about this in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, one time Lord Chaitanya was chanting 